Well, hello everyone. I want to share with you some research I did. Um, I'm going to go ahead and apologize ahead of time. This is probably going to be a pretty long video, but I think it's very enlightening and uh, very helpful in the long run. Um, so I'm calling it What Works uh, for Men of Color in Online Higher Education Programs. So I did a study um, with um, men of color and I called it Factors Contributing to the Success of Men of Color in Online Higher Education Programs, where essence, in essence what I was doing, I was looking to see what successful men of color, men of color who were being successful in their online academic program, what were they doing themselves to maintain and, and obtain and maintain that level of success. Now, success I defined as a 3.0 or above, uh, maintaining that, you know, across their career, and they were either they had either graduated within the past year or were on track to graduate within the next year at what 125 percent uh, graduation rate. Now, that 125 percent graduation rate, if you're not familiar with it, means basically a five year stay from course one to walking across the stage was five years. So, um, uh, that's how we define uh, successful. And that's, you know, the study we were trying to do. So what I did, we identified 4,100, I believe it was, at our university. Well, it was across three universities, three online universities. We identified 4,100 uh, uh, men of color that met the, the, the standards of successful by our definition. 1,300 of those men of color, and that 4,100 was over a three-year period. 1,300 of those men of color uh, agreed to the initial survey. Um, from that initial survey, we found some things uh, and uh, we created another survey and um, we found some more things and we went back to IRB and we then added some interviews, a qualitative component to the, the study. So um, in essence, we found eight common techniques and methods that the successful men of color themselves implemented in their programming so that they could obtain and maintain their level of success. We were then able to backwards design and take those eight common techniques and methods and across the three systems in the university, academics, student services, and student advising, we were able to um, uh, uh, come up with 10, I'm calling them systemic implications, 10 implications that the system could put in place to help students, all students, not just men of color, but all students operate or, or uh, make it easier for them to implement those eight common techniques and methods. Now, here's what happened. When we found those eight common technique or ne techniques or methods, I, I'm just being transparent with you, like it happened quickly. Like it, it, the, the coding was so easy, it, it, it like didn't seem like it was right. Like I knew something was wrong. Um, so I took a step back from the research and kind of looked at it differently. And that's where we came up with adding the qualitative component. So when we looked at the qualitative a data that we captured from the same group of people, um, we found that 90, something, something like fat, uh, just knocked me off, off my seat, changed actually how I see education, how I do education, period. I mean, I, I say it when I'm speaking, I say it jumped off the paper and punched me in my big old nose. So I saw that 97.8% of all of those students in that original study all operated in the same three pillars of mind. Um, and those pillars of mind were then necessary or common uh, for those successful men of color in their in their programming, and that meant that traditionally, as educators, we thought that the methods and the techniques we use in our classes were the major driver for uh, our student success, and that wasn't the case here. Actually, the major driver for the student success was those men of color's ability to map the techniques and methods to their thinking. They mapped the techniques and methods they used to how they were thinking, and that was the major driver for their success. And this was revolutionary. The three tech, the three common pillars uh, of, of, of thought or of mind that we found were here. Um, the first one is positive experiences. So I got to explain that to you a little. So bear with me. So if you're dealing with an at potential population um, that has lived in an at risk mindset all of their lives. Anytime that at potential population is living with an at risk mindset, whenever they deal with an institution or organization, a larger one, there is a us versus them mentality that comes up. And there's this automatic wall or set of expe expectations of how they're going to be treated or not treated or whatever the case may be. So when that at potential population encounters that organization, um, 
if they have a, a poor experience, a bad experience early on in that encounter, then that person from that at potential population will always expect to have negative experiences with that organization. Um, but if the people from that at potential population don't have in their initial responses, initial interactions, they don't have a, a negative experience, they have a positive one. So as far as we were concerned, it was academics, student advising, or student support services. These men of color did not have a negative experience in their initial dealings with either of these three compartments or departments across the university. So these three men of color, excuse me, these men of color did not have uh, the, the, the tendency to expect to have negative experiences. Because they had positive experiences in their initial interactions, then they, they had no reason to expect negative ones. They were then more open, more vulnerable, more transparent, and more communicable. So what happened was they were able to, uh, to communicate their needs and their desires differently, and they were able to then hear the services and resources that were available to them so they had a better experiences. So positive experiences is, was the first way of thinking. No reason to expect negative experiences. The second pillar of mind um, was they all had a major, I mean major commitment to their personal goals. Now you, you probably hear that all the time, but let me kind of explain the difference. A lot of times with us in life, you know, we have a goal, dream, aspiration, and we're hard driving toward that goal, dream, or aspiration. But something in life happens that kind of like switches up our life ingredients, you know, uh, the norms in our life a little bit. And what many of us will do, we may not give up that goal, dream, or aspiration, but we will alter it some um, to, to, you know, to be able to keep a forward motion in our lives. Well, these men of color, what they did when those traumatic events happened in their life that kind of change uh, the standard operating procedures in their lives, they didn't, they never changed that original goal. Even if it meant they had to wait for a while to get things back in line. But what they would do is they worked hard to restructure their lives or, or at least portions of their lives so they could continue to move towards their original goal. They were committed to those original goals. I mean, like committed. And they all had obligations in their lives, whether it was taking care of a loved one, whether it was financial, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, they had motivate. They had obligations that the average person would say, look, bruh, it's okay for you to take a break. Like we won't hold it against you. you you're carrying a lot of weight right now. These men of color that were successful, they saw those obligations not as weights or deterrences. They saw them as motivators. Because they had those obligations, their mindset was, I have no choice but to move forward and to keep going, you know, to get this done. So the things we learned from the, our uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, capturing of data, just in short, just to make it for time's sake, was one, we need to learn how, to th how our students think. We need to understand those pillars of mind and how are they thinking so they can be successful. Then we need to learn to think like them. So I can understand how you think, but if I don't think like you, then I'm not going to prepare uh, in ways that map to your thinking. I'm, I'm not going to prepare and put things in place that will support, you know, your standard operation uh, operating procedures or how you see or do life. So not only do I need to know how you think, I need to start thinking like you so I can create tools and supports and resources that will be beneficial to you. Meet your needs rather than try to make you meet mine. Um, so that's in essence number three, which is saying map your methods and your techniques to those pillars of mind. So the things that you do should map to how your students think uh, and not necessarily how you think. So in essence, we're saying overall, uh, get out of the way. You know, as an instructor dealing with uh, culturally responsive or, or just different diverse populations in your class, especially if they're at potential, you got to get out of the way and you got to put their thoughts and their needs up front. Why? Because the premise is this. If you can't relate, then you simply can't educate. I'll say it again. If you can't relate, you can't educate. So I want to share with you 10 high yield system wide implications uh, that I talked about earlier, the 10 high yield. Uh, in essence, these are the things you could do across the university, academics, student support, and student advising. These are things you can do in all of those, and it's a very busy slide, 
um, to help students be more successful, especially your at potential students. So you'll notice in the orange there, there's 10 techniques or methods, and I'm hoping that this is not cutting off the slide in any way. I can't see it. Um, hopefully it's not cutting off the slide. If it is, I apologize. But um, there's, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, if, if, if you need the PowerPoint, then text me and I'll, I'll or I mean, not text me, uh, email me and I'll go ahead and get the PowerPoint to you. But there's 10 techniques and methods listed on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you'll see three columns of pillars, pillar one, pillar two, pillar three. Well, those are the three, those are the pillars of mind we talked about. Those are the positive experience, the commitment to goals and the obligations or motivators. So one, two, and three. And that's what you see here. So for instance, if you're looking at that first technique or method, course at a glance tables, I'll tell you about that a little later. They map to pillar one. Um, uh, they make a good experience for the students from the beginning of the class. And they map to pillar two. They help keep students focused and, and, and uh, organized with their goals, dreams, and operations, uh, 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 aspirations because uh, we're, we're, we're breaking the table, we're breaking the course out at just a glance of a table so it helps the students organize a little better. So what my point for giving you this slide is if you look at these 10 high impact techniques and methods that we found through our research and what pillars of mind that they're mapping them to, I mean, this is like, this is like um, you know, techniques on steroids here. Um, these 10 techniques are powerful in the alone, but I'm telling you what pillars of mind, what thoughts they map to. And we already know that how our students think, if we can map our techniques and methods to them, that's the major driver for their success. So you want to choose methods and techniques so that you're covering all of the pillars of mind, um, you know, as, as often as possible. Now I want to share with you uh, eight high impact th techniques, but these aren't going to be university wide. These will be just for academics, just for instructional purposes. So these eight here, I mean, uh, we'll talk to you about all eight of them, but the first five are techniques and methods that are used across the board for every faculty in the programs I lead at our university. So our education study pro studies programs that I lead at our university, we have done the training, we've done the deep dive, we've done the hard discussions and the PLCs that dealt with everyone's thinking, with everyone's uh, belief systems, and, and we have come to a conclusion that every full-time and associate faculty that teaches in the education studies programs that I lead, as long as I'm there, they're going to use all five of these techniques and methods, the first five. Now, we use them differently, and I'll explain that to you, but they will be implemented somewhere in our instructional design because they we know they work for students. So let's look at relaxed deadlines. So relaxed deadlines, usually there's this hard line between, you know, late and not late. We're saying perforate that line. So they're perforated due dates and you do it on an ads need basis. So here's how kind of this works. When students come into a class and, and so let me back up a little. So for me, I do them to the extreme. Um, I will take something that's due on day one of the class. I'll, I'll receive it on the last day of the course with no penalty as long as the student has discussed with me or let me know um, that you know they, they, they can't get it in on time um, that's what I do now everyone in my program doesn't do it to that extreme um, some of them say you know you contact me I'll give you three extra days some of them have you know already set we have a week difference I mean you know Everyone does it a little differently. After those three days, I'll start taking two points off or something like that. They're still relaxed deadlines. The point is that there was some kind of conscious conversation with the student to let them know that this method, this technique, this accommodation is in place for them and communication is required. Um, so before I tell you how I do it, the reason why communication is so powerful is that with at potential populations, again, um, there is this tendency in a survival mindset that when you have to deal with a difficult conversation, ask for help or make yourself vulnerable. Um, sometimes if you act like it's not there, we feel like it's going to go away. Well, that's not the case. If you act like it's not there and it's there, it gets worse if you don't deal with it. So we, we're helping to teach our students, especially from at potential populations, listen, just let me know up front. What's the worst I can say? You know, but when they let us know what we're doing is we're saying, no problem. I have your back. You know, thank you for letting me know. And and they're more um, 
apt to do that again. So it's like praising desired behavior. The, des the behavior des that you praise is the behavior that will persist. So it's kind of helping our students holistically outside of just the content piece. So here's how I run relaxed deadlines. And I'm taking a long time on this one because to me, this is the most powerful technique you could put in place. You could put it in place today. You don't have to, you don't have to go through uh, faculty governance or anything. You can put this in place right now today. So here's what I do. At the beginning of the class, in my initial announcements video, I let the students know that I have this bank of, of accommodations I give them, and one of them is relaxed deadlines. That means, listen, as long as you let me know that you're going to turn something in uh, uh, past the deadline, then that's fine with me. Once you turn it in, just text me or email me that it's turned in so I know it's there, and I'll go ahead and I'll grade it. No penalty, right? So I let the students know that off the bat. I even put in that email, I say, listen, I have your back. I say those words exactly. Um, so what it does for our at potential populations in particular, and some of our students that are not at potential, but I mean, you know, they have a high demand career or family or something like that, um, which kind of makes them at potential actually, but I, I won't get into that right now. Um, it takes the anxiety off of them. It's like weight off their shoulders. I can't tell you how many times after they read those things or hear th that announcement, they contact me. Oh, God bless you, Mr. Miller. You're a godsend. Are you teaching any other courses? I wish more teachers did that. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just trying to get you to see that the students have gratitude towards those things. And that's how I know it was relieving anxiety because they were telling me that through those messages. Um, so here's what happens a lot of times for me. You'll say, what well, you probably say, well, you probably get a bunch of stuff to grade at the end of the course. And no, I don't. Actually, it's the exact opposite. Um, it's, it's the exact opposite. So when the students know that they're going to be able to turn something in with no penalty, and I am like courteous in, in you know, uh, thanking them when they tell me uh, that it's going to be late. Um, they, if it's due on Tuesday, and they tell me on Monday that they can't get it in. Now, I want you to look at the logistics. I'm really not going to grade those assess those, those assignments until probably Saturday, Friday. I might start them on Thursday, but it's Monday and they're telling me it's going to be late. I tell them, no worries. Don't worry about it. Text me or email me when you send it in. I have your back. By the time I go to grade them, they've actually already turned them in. So really, technically, they're not late because I haven't seen them yet you know, until I've opened them up. And that's kind of what happens. So that late turns into a couple of days because the students are way more, um, uh, you know, confident uh, that I have their back and they're not really as worried about it as much. Um, I have had some students, you know, that overlap a week or so, and they have a lot going on in their life. And I can kind of hear it in their voice and things like that if I call them on the phone and talk with them. So, um, it's not going to have a negative effect. It's not going to back you up. If you do it this way, you go first and let them know that it's for them. Um, I think you'll see the adverse effect of what you think may happen. It's actually a positive thing. I put exemplars as examples in our course. Um, and what that is, that's, that's an example of a paper or project or whatever it is that you have students turning in that week. Um, so, and I use past students projects. So I contact the student, ask them, can I use it? They say, yes. Of course, and I put it up there. I remove the student's name, um, but the other students can tell that it's student work. What this does is it jumpstarts the students' thinking before they even start doing their own work, and it it has it, a lot of people say, well, then you probably get the same kind of papers, the same kind of projects, not a lot of creativity, and that's the exact opposite. Because they see what an A looks like, right, and they they have this jumpstart piece. What happens is I see more creativity and I see students taking a deeper dive because now they see what that A looks like. They add their own flavor and go a little deeper. So what happens is every year I end up changing my exemplars because the papers and the projects keep getting better and better. The other question I get is, you know, do you get people who cheat? Well, I've been at this university over eight years. I've taught just under 200 courses in that time. And I can only remember three times that a student has actually copied and pasted either the whole or parts of that um, exemplar example and turned it in. And when I call the student, because I do it very bluntly, I'll call the student and, you know, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you, you have to know that I know what this was. I'm the one that posted it, right? And, and you know, you can't do that kind of thing. 
um, they they appreciate my honesty and candor, and they say, "Look, Dr. Miller, all three of them said I ran out of time, and um, I didn't want to not turn in anything. I figured maybe he won't see it. Uh, well, I did see it, you know, and you have three days to get something in, and let me know if you need my help. You got the examples to look at." Thank you very much. Don't you ever do that again. And we keep it moving. Um, so those exemplars examples have ramped up the quality of work that I've gotten. It jump starts the students thinking. It's a very, very uh, excellent help for them. They love them. And, and I like them too. Something you should try. I not F is, is another technique or method. I learned this um, from the K-12 uh, uh, arena um, when I worked at um, our uh, uh schools and urban districts. So basically it means incomplete, not F. Incomplete, not failing. Um, so uh, uh, if a student turns something in and I happen to see the pattern of the work was kind of below par for what they're used to turning in, um, and I don't know why, you know, maybe they had something going on that week, maybe they were just tired, or they just got a little lazy, whatever the case may be. Um, I go ahead and I put that formative feedback on that paper. Or maybe the paper just was incomplete. They missed pieces, you know, or they didn't dig as deep as they needed to dig um, with the content. I put formative feedback on there, asking questions, probing questions, uh, pushing their critical thinking and the problem solving skills, you know, and I don't grade that paper. Well, I'm, I'm lying. I, I put a zero in, in the grade book. <laughs> right but it's not a zero to stay it's a placeholder for me um because i know if it's a zero it's something that i sent back to them because i just don't give zeros um so uh, uh, uh i send that back with the zero and i send a message to them and i put the message on the paper in canvas and i also email it to them and the message says hey this was a little below what i was used to i put some formative feedback on there check out my feedback and here's what i do and I, and I say this almost verbatim. I say, when you uh, make those corrections, resubmit the paper and text or email me so I can change your grade. When you make the changes, right, resubmit the paper, text me or email me so I can make the changes. So, there's two things in there. I say when, because I'm really not giving them an option. I'm saying to them, I'm expecting you to fix this, right? I'm not asking you to, I'm expecting you to. And then I say, so I can change it because I want them to know that I want to change that grade. I want you to get the highest grade possible, right? Um, which is different than the experience that a lot of our at potential uh, students have had with any organization or institution right um so then we kind of move it from there now the reason i put a zero there and i don't grade it um is because at potential populations in particular come from a survival mindset and you can survive with a c or a d um but you can't survive with an f with a zero so <laughs> because they want to succeed if i put the zero there it gets their attention now that doesn't just work for at potential populations that works for those that you know are, are not at potential as well uh, so i put the zero there that gets their attention and their the, the, the probability i've never not had anyone not return that paper uh, it's not not once it's been 100 percent effective uh, every time Access and availability simply means this. We tell our students, contact me as soon as you need me and as often as you need me. As soon as you need me, as often as you need me. That means I have an obligation to tell you how to contact me. I need to, I need to be accessible and, accessible, and I need to be um, uh, available. So I give, and many other full-time and part-time faculty in our programs, in Ed Studies, give our students our cell phone number. They can text us or they can call us. Now, if I don't know a number and I tell the students, if I don't know your number, I'm not going to answer it. So leave a message, right? But you can text me anytime. So if I'm if I'm pumping gas at the gas station or I'm in a line at Walmart or wherever the case, watching TV, I can respond to your text and answer your question immediately. Now, I may not do it immediately. I may be busy, but I'll get to it as soon as I can. And the students love that. For our at potential students, it lets them know that they're not alone. It lets them know that they're, you know, 
I, I work for them and with them. It's a partnership. I have your back. Let me know what you need and, and, and I'll take care of you. Um, and I'll take care of you as soon as I can. Um, so it's, it's like a safety blanket around them. Um, they then feel more connected. Uh, they then feel more confident. Uh, they ask better questions. There's more of an attack, uh, 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 and a vulnerability, an attack to, uh, uh, you know, on the content, to the task. Um, and I, and I seen, since I've been doing that, I've seen, it was actually the millennial that said to me, why don't you just give me your cell phone number? Right. I was like, wow, I never thought of that. Right. Since I've been doing that, it's been about four years, uh, a little over four years that I particularly been given my cell phone number. I've seen a great increase in, in grades and in retention in my courses. Um, so those of you who don't want to give them your cell phone number, again, you want to have multiple ways they can contact you, whether it's your phone, whether it's your uh, uh, office phone, whether it's email, um, you know, uh, um, it, whether it is the inbox within the class. Another thing that I do is I create pages um, in social media. I have pages where students can jump on that page for the course and they can put their question or their issue up on the page and it's an open page. So there's other students that are in the course now and have been in the course before that give advice to students as well. Um, but for those you don't want to give your number, uh, there's different apps. Google talks is one of them. There's a couple of different apps where you, the students either, they either text or email an address or a phone number that's not yours. And it shows up on your phone as a text. And there's a couple of free apps out there you can use for that. Access and availability sounds real simple. Sounds simple, but I mean, it is powerful. It is out of the world powerful for at potential students. Um, course weekly introduction videos, exactly what it says. It's just videos um, to explain the course. In our uh, undergrad programs, we have course weekly course videos uh, uh, for every course in every week um, in, in our undergrads. Now, I teach in some programs that don't have them. So you know what I do? I create my own videos. I put them on, on my, my Google Drive and I go ahead and put the link to those videos in my announcements uh, whenever I teach those courses. Even the courses I teach in my own program, I still put my own videos. Now, the reason I do that is because I code switch in those videos. I break them down. I take away all the vocabulary. Um, I I don't have my bow tie on, you know, I do them, some of them, you know, outside. I did a couple in the gym just to put the students at ease, let them know they're talking to another human being. Um, and what happens is if I learn something new about the students, another pitfall or another roadblock that they're matching in the class, that's the only time I make a new video and I warn the students of those pitfalls or roadblocks as well. So course weekly introductory videos are very powerful especially for at potential students donna beagle dr donna beagle's research shows us that at potential students come from what's called an oral culture an oral culture and our schools our education system is more of a print rich culture so when you use these videos it, it, it's more of an oral cultural approach which maps with the student's mind they understand what you want better so now when they see it in writing they can make that connection it's andrew goji they can make that connection a little better and they are way more successful for that week's content course of the glance tables are very similar to the um the videos they're just a, a, a table so you make a table of what students need each week so for instance in this week week one they have a discussion they have a journal and they have a powerpoint to do so you give them the instructions for the discussion just in a few words um you know compare and contrast formative assessments and then you say 20 minutes that's how long it's going to take you for the journal you say um reflect on a class you observed throughout the week um 45 minutes um, then you have the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation and you'll say, um, uh, after reflecting on the class, recreate your own lesson plan, uh, with two things that you would do differently from the from the teacher you observed and you say 90 minutes. So now they know what they have to do. They know what their estimated time, um, uh, uh, commitment will be. And that's very powerful for, for all students, especially those taking course online. That means their life is busy. So that's going to help them kind of manage uh, their actions and the things they do within the time that we're given, the 24 hours we're given within a day, um, especially you're at potential students. And it's a great skill that you're teaching them 
because it's not something that uh, many at potential students have had to do. Um, so this teaches them a skill to be way more productive in other areas of their life outside the classroom. Then we have the motivational quotes and videos. So um, in at potential populations in particular, you guys, community is a skill for survival. Using the resources in the community is a skill for survival. So um, uh, what happens is uh, uh, these communities don't often have a lot of resources. So um, they grab around, they lean toward, they have a bend toward things that are more internal, uh, more spiritual, um, you know, more, more um, uh, motivating or something they can gather around, idealistic. Um, than they are with physical things. So these motivational quotes, videos, and testimonials, they speak to their spirit man. They speak to their mental uh, stability. They speak to their, their motivation, their desire to, to keep moving. Um, so just use them. You know, embed them in your courses, put them in your announcements, send them as emails, um, you know, have a nice little saying at the bottom of your emails. Mine is stay anxious to make a difference. Um, or I'll say educate, motivate, help them grow, or I'll just say stay motivated, um, you know, but those things like that are just more powerful for at potential populations than you can believe. The only way you'll know is if you've ever been in that arena. Sometimes these quotes, these videos, these sayings, these testimonials are the only thing that are keeping your at potential learners going. They, sp they speak specifically to the second and the third pillar of mind, um, keeping focus on the goals and, and dreams and aspirations and making their uh, um, their obligations motivators. Um, so use them, use them, use them. And finally, we have cohorts and groups. So I know that um, doing group work in online courses is like a pain. It is a pain, uh, <laughs> a very often a pain. To, to manage and you know to put together so what i'm saying to you here is encourage your students to work in groups even if the, the the assignment is an individual assignment tell them to work in groups tell them to work together i can't think of any time that i didn't especially in my bachelor's degree didn't work together with somebody i always had a team of people we met with study with you know compare and contrast our stuff with i mean all the way through my doctorate's degree you know uh uh We've done that. So encourage the students to work together, pull from each other. Again, community is a survival skill for at potential populations. So encourage them to create community of learners. It's actually key number four in creating a, a culturally responsive classroom system, uh, the community of learners. So you go ahead and you partner with them by encouraging them to create those communities and work together. Um, and you will see um, a, a, a much, much, much greater, greater level of efficiency uh, with your students. So I told you I would show you some data. So we started putting those top five, I just gave you all eight, but the first five in our education studies programs, um, the bachelor's program in particular, um, back in 2014 and up to 2019, you have about a 14% increase in retention rates of our students. 14% more students who start our courses are finishing them. Uh, so 97% of the students who start our courses finish them, and that is fantastic. We started at a 19.7% failure rate back in 2014. That's what got me to kind of jump on this. That's too high of a failure rate. Um, over the five-year period, uh, we've dropped down to a 3.5% uh, failure rate. Actually, I have the 220 data, and it's, it's right at 3%. Um, so I'm not sure we'll get any lower than that, but 3% is a good number. Um, so 3% uh, uh, of the students who take our courses will fail those courses. And, and um, so uh, we don't want anyone to fail, but I mean, you know, reality is reality. So 97 and 3.5 are the numbers we have. So if you would like to see those kind of numbers in your program, we encourage you to do what works for at potential students in online higher education programs. I'm Dr. Newt, and I encourage you to make it a great day or not, because that choice is always yours.